You're listening to One Free Family, a new take on peaceful parenting, where you can hear ideas for helping to raise free, independent, and peaceful children. Visit OneFreeFamily.com to connect and listen. Here are your hosts, James and Taylor Davis. And we're back with another episode of One Free Family. This One is James. One Free Family. This is Taylor. And we are super pumped to talk to you all today. Once again, this is actually something of a follow-up on a previous episode that we did about money. Uh, in that episode, we talked about helping kids learn sort of an entrepreneurial attitude. And that's grown into this episode, which won't be explicitly only about kids and entrepreneurism, but more trying to help families, uh, parents and kids in particular, work through all of the feelings they have about the age old question of uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? Right. Or what do your kids want to be when they grow up? Or, you know, all of these sort of future based questions around vocation and passion or employment or simply making ends meet and kind of how we're working through those in our family right now. And, you know, just a, a little framework for y'all to kind of look at as well to, I don't know, just think a little bit more intentionally about these sorts of topics. Yeah. And in case this is the first episode of the show that you're listening to, it probably would be helpful to know that we're coming at this from, you know, obviously our own experiences with our own careers and work life, but also, you know, our kids are eight, six, and two. So we're, you know, we're coming at it from a point at which our kids are still pretty young. And I don't know, I think that just gives some context for where we're at. Um, I think that we talk a lot about, you you know, you hear the question, what are you going to be when you grow up? And James and I talk a lot about how the way that we choose to parent is, you know, a big thing that we focus on is like, we're not just parenting because we're preparing our kids for the future, right? We also really, really value the present moment and we want our kids and our family to be satisfied and fulfilled in the now before we worry about the future. So I think that that applies in this situation because, we really, as we were kind of preparing for this episode and talking about it, we were talking about how we really think that what we do with our kids and them living in the moment and being present actually as a byproduct will prepare them well to support themselves in whatever way they choose to support themselves, you know, financially when they're older. And we're going to kind of dive into that a little bit today. Yeah. I think one of the most common interactions between adults and kids is one that has to do with just asking kids about what comes next, right? Like anything except the present moment. Yeah. So it's a lot of like, oh, are you excited for school? Are you excited for middle school? You're going or high to kindergarten school? soon. Yeah. yeah. Are you excited for college? Where are you going to go to college? Have you started applying? Hey, are you going to go to grad school or get an internship or where do you want to work? And it really never yeah. ends. Oh, so are you two going to get married? Oh, you're married now. Are you going to have kids? Yeah. Are you like... going to retire soon? You know, <laughs> it'll bring you right up until death if you let it. And I mean, on some level, it's people showing interest in one another and, yeah. and trying to connect on the basis of interests and plans. And, and that, that all of those things are very important. I think with kids though, there's nothing that I've read or none of the interactions I've had with young people. And I've interacted with a lot of people and seen the progression from them being say like an early teenager up until they're, they've become adults. Right. Right. And I don't see any real correlation between having a concrete plan as to what you want to be when you grow up, when you're 10 to, a happy and focused adulthood, right? So like, I don't think that that sort of discussion is really necessary on any level in terms of helping a kid, you know, kind of really visualize where they want to be someday. And also I I think a lot of questions like that, they're not very actionable. So like if a kid is 10 and you grill them on what they want to be when they grow up, they can tell you, I want to be a doctor or a baseball player or whatever. But unless we're really talking about taking steps to move in that direction, I actually think it just kind of begins the process of layering anxiety onto kids about or ex- this bu- laying expectations on them that yeah. they feel almost obligated to fulfill or yeah, whether they do or not. I mean, yes. Cause sometimes people will like, I've heard the kind of the laughing comment. I remember when you used to say you wanted to be a research scientist, ha ha ha, you know, like this kind of know it all tone that people can take with young people sometimes. But I think many cases it's, it comes from a very good place again of wanting to get to know someone, but it just, kind of a confusing question in general, right? Like kids, especially very young ones have no idea what it means. They're living in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they don't really even want to think about their big term hobbies or their interests that way just yet. Like they just want to be present with them. And, and so I think when we're thinking about trying to equip our kids 
for the future, one of the very best things we can do to start is to not make the future seem so ominous and so important. Like Mm -hmm. let the, you know, if they continue to live in the present and pursue things on their own terms, obviously they will think about, they will notice like, oh, I'm going to be an adult someday. They, you know, they're not going to forget that they are going to need a job someday. Especially the older (laughs) they get, right? Right, As they become teenagers and think about you know, it's natural for humans to think about what's next for themselves. There will at some point, I believe, become an inner drive and a self-motivation to figure out like, okay, well, you know, how might I earn money? How might I start doing that? Okay. What steps do I need to take? And I'm totally not advocating for parents to just at that point, step back and say, oh, just worry about right now. Like if your kid is a teenager and they're coming to you and they have this path that they really want to pursue, um, you're going to help them with that, of course. Yeah. Right on. And I think, You know, as we're also trying to picture our relationship to kids and this, what will ultimately become a very important subject, it's really, I think, worthwhile to be intentional about understanding that so much of these conversations are just driven by present day societal norms, right? So Mm -hmm. like 30 years ago, when people were asking young kids about what they wanted to be when they grew up, things like being an online entrepreneur wasn't even an option, right? So like, it would make no sense to come to someone in their 30s now and say, Hey, you never said you wanted to be an online entrepreneur when you grew up, because again, that category wasn't even a thing yet. Right. Right. And so when we ask kids, like, do you want to be a doctor or a lawyer or like, you know, whatever kind of cliche occupation that feels like making it is in, in whatever society you're living in, we run the risk of helping them to think inside of a certain very specific box that comes not just from our society, but our own personal life experiences. And I I think that's also why it's worthwhile just to kind of take a step back and realize like whatever is currently going on in society could look totally different. Right. And instead of trying to help them aim at a target that's in the present, but try to get there in the future, maybe trying to equip them with a way of thinking, a way of being a way of approaching their interests, right. In a way of just approaching life that allows them to follow their interests and accomplish goals that they set for themselves. Yeah, sure. Like, so in the nineties, when becoming a computer programmer became a much more realistic occupation for a lot of people that a lot of that wasn't because those people were told, Hey, well, if you work on these typing skills, now you can program, you can invent Yahoo and make $40 billion or whatever. It was just that these people were in a position to use their gift of learning, their gift of finding, figuring out what the next big thing is going to be and -hmm. and kind of jump right in with two feet. And many of those people, like if you read about Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or kind of the early tech entrepreneurs, they were just following their own interests against the advice of the people in their society who would would say like, why don't you just finish out your degree and -hmm. then get into it, right? Even more present day examples like Mark Zuckerberg or whoever else. Let's just actually dive in though and talk about some of the stuff that happens in our day-to-day life and you know, kind of the conversations and interactions uh, that we hope to have with our kids and kind of contrast them, I think, too, to the way kids are currently interacted with, right? So I think one of the primary things for us, and again, this is this might wind up being more specific to our lifestyle than universally applicable, but I think it actually applies to other people in other walks of life as well, is that so many of the unintended lessons that kids learn from the time they're very young is to defer to authorities, right? So kind of tell them what to do next and how mm -hmm. to act and what to be interested in. Yeah. Right. So from the moment that they are born in many ways, there is some sort of boss figure, right? Right. Um, And so, you know, a value for us is to helping our kids to be more autonomous for a lot of kids though. Autonomy is, is not a reality in their current day to day. And if the kids are attending school, then it's going to be, I think even more incumbent upon the parents to help them to control their own destiny more in the home, just so they know that's an option, right? Right. So they know that they can choose kind of what to do with their time when they, you know, inevitably when they're grownups, they're going to, if, especially if they're in school, they're going to have a lot more of their own time to decide what to do with it. And if they don't have practice figuring out how to use that time and what to do, it's going to be harder for them. Of course. Yeah. And, And I think, you know, thinking about the relationship of the kid in school and the kid at home and just how society views the adult child relationship. So much of it about like, even it's most of the main questions we get when we share with people that we're taking this self-directed approach to living for our kids is like, well, who's going to teach them X or Y, right? Like this even happened to Ollie, our oldest son on his soccer team the other day. Uh, Some of the kids quizzed him or they asked him what grade he was in. Yeah. Do you want me to tell the story since he relayed it to me? Yeah. Um, Third hand. (laughs) I guess. Yeah. During his soccer game, one of the kids on his team asked him what grade he was in. And he said, oh, I don't go to school. 
And another kid said, oh, he's probably homeschooled. Totally in good, like, it, they weren't being unkind at all. They were just commenting. Right. And then the the first child said, oh, no. One kid said, oh, he's probably homeschooled. And Ali said, I'm no schooled. I think <laughs> that's what he told me he said. And then the first child said, well, then how do you learn? And Ollie said, he just told them, well, I just learn. Yeah. Right. But in, implicit in that other kid's question is like, I learn because adults make me or right. adults show me what's important. And then I learn about that. Right. And, and they also teach me the content too. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And this is very much an employee's mentality. Right. You know? and, and I'm not saying that in a derogatory fashion, but it like literally is when you go and get a job in most places, unless you're the boss or something. You're going to go and get a job and some employer is going to tell you what's important to learn. They're going to oversee you and, and monitor your progress. And it's going to be very much about pleasing that employer and demonstrating for them that you're doing a good job. And this almost exactly mirrors the experience of most top-down educational paradigms, right. right? And so if kids only spend their time in those sort of top-down educational paradigms, I think I, I've seen this with a number of friends, acquaintances, read about it online, seen it in my employees at camp and so forth. People come in looking for answers, you know, looking, do you mean looking to be directed, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's right. A good point. They're, they're yeah. not looking for answers. They come in waiting for someone to come and approach right. them and give them instruction. Yeah, there and we go. I think that's, uh, I think that's extremely problematic. And I, I think it's actually problematic regardless of your role. Cause I'll also say the very best employees are the ones that come in and kind of make it their own. You right. Know? You can still be an employee of somebody and have tasks that you're required to accomplish, but you can bring kind of more of a self-directed approach to that. And some of those employees will be the ones who will kind of innovate within their business or change something within their um, within their field or their company or wherever. Yeah. And it's a term I heard actually on the Fizzle podcast when I was learning about on online business. Um, it's called entrepreneurship, which is joining an organization and kind of being entrepreneurial within it. Right. 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 And it's, it's really funny. Like I've seen this happen any number of times where there's some issues, say like the waterfront at summer camp. And I have two counselors just sitting there staring at it and waiting for me to show up. And then some other counselors showing up and it's called taking initiative. Right. right. This is a very common buzzword term in, in interviews and, you know, and companies talk about this when they're looking for employees and whatnot, but someone comes in and is like, okay, well, James isn't here to tell us what to do. And this is a new thing that he didn't train us for, right. but let's apply what we've learned from him and what we know about this organization's values to try our best and right. accomplish it. And now they don't have always, an idea. Let's try it. Exactly. Now yeah. they don't always pin it down and get it perfectly. But when you're working with other people, or when you're employing other people, you don't need them to get it perfect, but you would like for them to not ignore it or to not have or them... to not wait exactly. for you when you're busy doing something else and something needs to be handled or to not shut down completely and think like, Oh, this wasn't part of the, you know, the mandatory lesson. Right. And so I can ignore this like the old, you know, nothing should be more heartbreaking for a teacher. I know it was for me when I taught briefly when some, a, t a student asks, is this going to be on the test as <laughs> right. in, I don't really care at all about any of the stuff you're saying, but yeah. if you're going to make me prove that I know this later, then I'll pay attention. Well, yeah, of you know? course. <laughs> can't so, blame anyone for that. <laughs> no, you really can't. I mean, and I wondered that and asked that explicitly many times uh, during my educational process growing up. But I think when we're trying to picture helping children become productive and capable adults, we don't want them thinking, is this going to be on the test later, right? We want right. them to be constantly going through this process of like, is this important to me or important to the work that I'm doing? And if so, how do I apply it? Yeah. So I think all this to say, you know, if we're raising our kids this way, I'm thinking about my own three kids, regardless of what type of work they do when they're adults to support themselves, whether they become somebody's employee, whether they do work that they don't love, but it makes them enough money to pursue their passions outside of that work, right? right? Or whether they find, you know, whether they become entrepreneurs and do this passion driven work that also earns them money, whatever they choose. I think that um, supporting them to be self-directed and passion-driven learners now will set them up for more um, success and satisfaction in whatever path that they take. Yeah, exactly. And I think that the opportunity for helping kids grow in that area is still ultimately totally there for schooled kids as well, because I do too. they're going to have all this time when they're at home, all this time on the weekends and during summers and so mm -hmm. forth. And I think it's why it's even more important to not load up and double down on you know, kind of mandatory or, you know, adult led or adult driven exercises, right? After school and in the summer yeah, and things exactly. like that. Because yeah. kids will ultimately land on something they're really excited about. And 
helping people to understand. So like, I guess I'll equate it to when I first started learning to play poker because none of this sort of self-directed knowledge or self-directed pursuits thing came supernaturally to me. I don't think like Mm -hmm. when I was young, I went to school when I was in employee places, I was not a super great employee. I was like pretty effective in the jobs just because I was like a cashier and, Mm -hmm. you know, doing unskilled labor and whatnot. But it wasn't really until I wanted to make money playing poker that I was doing something where no one handed me a playbook, you know, right? because I gotten pretty effective at taking the playbook and running with it, right? Like when we were working at summer camp, I was pretty good at our first summer camp gig at doing what my predecessors had done and maybe slightly giving it my own flavor, right? right? But ultimately I was doing if you zoom out the exact same job that my predecessors were doing, like when I was, you know, managing small groups of employees at camp or whatever else, but in poker, I came in and there was literally no playbook at the time. Right. There were some books here and there, but poker is this live action environment where you constantly have to be thinking because no poker book can have 5 million examples. Every scenario that could possibly come up. (laughs) Exactly. So instead good poker books give you a way of thinking about things. Sounds like parenting books. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Well, exactly. And, People will try with parenting to say, here is your tools for being a good parent. And very few people are trying to say, here's a way of thinking about parenting that will, a new lens for looking at parenting that will help shade all your- Help guide your decisions. Exactly. So hopefully that's what this podcast is in some ways. But um, but yeah, so in poker, it was like, okay, there are these books. They're not applicable for everything. So what do I do? Well, I turned to online communities. I thought about it my own. I reached out to some of the authors of these books, asked them more nuanced questions. I kept track of my own progress and, Mm -hmm. you know, figured out tools and software to use to kind of monitor things and keep track. And ultimately I became pretty good at creating my own playbook for improvement at poker. I would go on to start a continuing education site for poker. I would go on to, you know, do coaching and none of this felt particularly spectacular to me until I got back into summer camping seven years after playing poker professionally. Right. Right? So I was basically totally uh, quote unquote unschooled in my poker pursuit. But when I came back to camping, I realized that that old playbook that I had been using for camping in the yeah, past, it, it, yeah. it was obsolete in the past, much less <laughs> right, 10 much years less, later yeah. <laughs> when I was using it again. But all of a sudden I could think back to, Oh yeah. Well, when I got into poker, I didn't know what I was doing in that either. And I would recall the steps that I took. Okay, well, what did I do? I reached out to experts. I tried to find written materials. You know, I I did this guess and check thing. I talked to other people who were successful in it. And sure enough, that playbook that worked for poker worked in camping too. And we had tremendous success there as well. And so I think it's a, I think you run a pretty significant risk when you get in the habit of just handing your child playbook after playbook rather mm-hmm. than trying to take a step back and think like, how good is my child becoming at developing their own playbook? Right. For this how can I support them to learn how to develop their own playbook? Right. And so it becomes less about, at least for me, when I'm thinking about our kids, it becomes less about the actual um, content of what they're interested in and what they're pursuing and much more about supporting them to learn how to dive into their passions and supporting their, um, you know, their exploration of problem solving techniques Mm. and, um, learning how to get more information when they need more information. So, you know, over the course of our children's lives, that's going to happen around so many different topics and content areas, right? Just depending on what they're interested in at the time. Um, so it's, there's so many opportunities, I think, for them to develop that playbook for themselves about like, how do I pursue something I'm interested in? How do I get more information about this? How do I deal with this problem that came up when I was trying to accomplish this goal? And then that all kind of builds on itself, you know, up until and throughout the time that they're adults, I would say. Yeah. And I think really inherent in all that too. I mean, you talked about how do I accomplish this goal? This is also where the entrepreneurial mindset contrasts to sort of the employee's mindset. Mm -hmm. Because very often when I've been an employee and working for someone else, the employer's goals sometimes feel sort of arbitrary, right? Like they have, they've set forth this, you know, goal that they made up. Sometimes they do a better job of explaining it than others, but they come forth and they want to say, okay, here's what our company's goals are. Or even something basic, like here's what a clean bathroom looks like to me when I was Mm -hmm. doing like janitorial work at that same camp. Right. And so you come in and even if you can picture what a clean bathroom looks like, you don't really care about the most efficient mopping techniques because like you just want to get the bathroom clean and be done. Right. You know? But in self-motivated pursuits, I feel like I've had a different standard for excellence that sure. I wanted to pursue. Right. And this yields a totally different approach to learning than being told what to do. And I think right. 
uh, helping our kids to have as much space as possible to define their own goals, even if they're goals in, in pursuit of something that we find confusing or maybe, or that we don't, we can't find value in. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So like, per, you know, for a lot of people, video games fall under this category, right? Like they can watch their child pursuing expertise in a video game or watching, why would you watch someone else play a video game? You know, right. all these other sorts of questions, but they're studying, they're studying yeah. yeah, and they're, they have a goal and they're having difficulty accomplishing their goal just by sitting down and playing. And so they're seeking outside source materials and, you know, checking in with experts and all these and other the cool things, part you know? about, yeah, the cool part about, I think, supporting self-directed learners now in 2018 is that there are so many ways for even like even children who don't read yet to learn what they need to learn to do what they want to do. Like, I mean, we all use, I'm sure almost everyone listening can think of a time they used like a YouTube video to learn how to do something that they needed right. to do. Right. There's so much, there's so many amazing resources out there that are so accessible to pretty much anybody to help them pursue their interests. And that's super cool. Well, and another really cool thing that I like to point out to our kids and just to people I know in general is whenever you hear someone saying, I was trying to look up how to do X and I couldn't find anything. My response is that sounds like a business idea, you know, because chances yeah. <laughs> are good. And I, I, this has worked. This is explicitly how we created the business that pays most of our bills now, which is we were in this space, daily fantasy sports, which I, you know, isn't my big passion or anything like that. But we noticed my friend Doug noticed that there were no good content creators in this field that were satisfying his needs as a consumer, right. as someone who wanted to learn how to do this better. And so what we did was get good at it and then teach other people. Right. And this is like a really cool thing about being self-motivated as well as like when you're out there in the world, trying to figure out what's important to you and, you know, trying to figure out how to be better at the things you like, inevitably you will hit those roadblocks. And if you want, you can step right into that as an entrepreneurial opportunity. And I think, right. you know, for our eight, six and two year old, that's not going to be as applicable, but, you know, helping them have that on their radar. Cause this is how, like, if you think about many of the really big, good businesses that are out there in the world right now, this is how a lot of those got started. And most people sit there and they go, why didn't I think of Netflix? You know, <laughs> yeah. but the creators of Netflix thought, why do I have to drive to Blockbuster to go get a video? Yeah. You know? And I think that's really the, the entrepreneurial mindset that we again, even if our kids wind up working for someone else someday, mm -hmm. that that will really serve them. I think so too. Yeah. Okay. So let's go back real quick. Cause we touched on this earlier and we didn't actually pin it down. I think as concretely as we hoped to, when we were planning the show and this is around when our kids do start sinking their teeth into something, right? Because into a passion. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. they start getting into something and you've been listening to this podcast and you're like, Ooh, is this something that my kid might want to think more entrepreneurially about? Or yeah. is this something that might be the thing that they go really deep on and it becomes their big passion where they practice learning and all that stuff? Like talk about our experience with yeah, that. Yeah. So kind of I think that's, now. you know, as a parent, that's naturally, that's a really natural reaction to have, right? You see your kid, especially, especially even more so if it's something that you love or something that you value, yeah. right? But you see your kid get involved, get getting interested in something and you start to like connect the dots in your head and, you know, look into the future and think like, oh my gosh, this is going to be the thing. Like they found their thing. And I really, th I have learned in my experience with our kids so far to back off of that a little bit mm. because I find I have learned a f multiple times that the minute I get those thoughts in my head, how it um, manifests in my actions is that I start becoming a bit overbearing with them <laughs> about that passion or interest. And inevitably I, I start to turn them off from mm. that interest. You know, all of a sudden it's not theirs anymore. I've kind of taken it from them and layered this expectation on top of, you know, I've kind of labeled them as like, oh, you love dinosaurs or whatever, you know, and maybe mm. you're going to be an archaeologist, an archaeologist yeah. <laughs> or something. Right. And, yeah. you know, I think it's fine to mention, you know, like, oh, there's actually grownups who like do this as a job just so that they, you know, they know it's out there and they know it's an option someday. Um, but I, I think that I have learned to be careful about kind of forecasting in my own mind that this could become the thing in the future. Because like I said before, I think especially when our kids are really young, it's less about the content and it's more about supporting them and their process of being kind of a self-directed passion led learner and an entrepreneurial thinker. So, um, I think that 
obviously if my child is really interested, interested in something, I'm going to support that interest and I'm going to find additional things to kind of offer to them to help them feed that interest or build on that interest. And I'm going to help them pursue their goals. But I do try to be careful about kind of forecasting that this is going to be like their big thing. Um, cause I think it can just become too much. Yeah. That's a great observation. I think it's, you know, it, you see this actually, I remember growing up and seeing this in the arena of sports where kids were playing sports with me. And there was one kid in particular who was like super, super, super good at basketball. And everyone would be like, Hey, you should think about going to the NBA someday. And like, he'd be like, yeah, haha, that would be fun. And, and all that kind of thing. But in thinking back in hindsight, I feel like he was trying to have fun playing basketball right. and everyone else was trying to turn it into his career. But the problem is like, I feel like a lot of people who wind up having a really offbeat sort of career, it's not that they were sitting there thinking in this calculated fashion, like, mm, if I sit down and just practice violin for the next 50,000 hours, like I could be a professional violinist. It's like the violin spoke to them in such a way that they couldn't help but not but play engage it. with it. And right. they loved it and they engaged it so hard. And then after a certain period of time, they realized they had achieved a certain level of expertise via their own passion and that now they could bring that to bear in some sort of professional capacity. Right. And uh, there's going to be exceptions to this. I mean, there are certain careers that you m simply must work hard at from a young age in order to be a professional at. Right? right. And maybe basketball actually is one of them, but for basically everything else, like the amount that a kid wants to engage it is enough. <laughs> like, right. Right. And I think, right. That's the thing. And then the minute that we start laying on our adult expectations of like, well, if this is something you really love and you want to be good at it, you should probably be practicing yeah, it let's three hours for a ski day. Lessons and, and, yeah. yeah I think you kind of, you, you kind of rob them of experiencing it in their own way. And it's not malintentioned when parents do this at all. Um, it's because you want to, you know, we want to support our kids to accomplish things. And we see this excitement that they have about something, but I've learned to be very careful because if I get, too invested like that. I think I often ruin their excitement. And you had me thinking too, when you were talking about this kid with basketball, I also worry about people like that because I worry that in a story like that, when that person, if that person does not become an NBA player mm. or does not see themselves, you know, they get to a certain age and they're not going down that path. What kind of baggage do they now have to deal with of like, well, have I failed now because I'm not doing this thing that everybody said I should do just because I'm good at this? Or if they just choose that they decide they don't like it enough, you know? Yeah, well, it's interesting. There's another guy. This guy actually went to my college. And it, oddly enough, it was also a basketball thing. But he showed up at this one in, random intramural basketball game. And the guy was like probably six foot one, had like long hair, you know, would wear baggy jeans around campus. You would never have guessed he was a great athlete or anything like that. But he showed up to sub on this one intramural basketball team and came in and was like, dunking with two hands and like doing all this stuff. And everyone's like, what the heck is going on? Like mm -hmm. this guy, Ron is like insane at basketball. And so I remember going up to him with like a bunch of other people after the game being like, dude, what just happened out there? You know? Right. And, uh, he was like, oh yeah, I used to play basketball in high school. And like, you know, my parents wanted me to go and play in college, but I just didn't want to. He's like, and now I'm just like, honestly, totally sick of basketball right. and being told that it's, I'm this huge waste of talent was the term. Right. He used. That's exactly what and I'm he, talking yeah, about. And yeah. He, and it was funny with him because it's like, yeah, he was insanely good at basketball and probably at one point did really, really like it. But all that pressure literally completely killed it to where he didn't yeah. even want to play intramural basketball yeah. in college because it, his whole life had been about, will he get in? Like what he said is he didn't get into a D one college. He was going to play D two, but everyone in his life felt like that was a failure. Right. And exactly. then he just gave up completely. <laughs> yeah. And so. so I think, yeah, of course, again, you know, want to temper this with, we don't just want to ignore our kids' interests and let them flounder on their own, trying to figure it out. Of course we want to support right. them and feed them. But I think just checking in with ourselves about what kind of level of expectation we're holding about where mm -hmm. this thing is going to go. And also reminding ourselves that if it does fizzle, then that's okay too. Like there's going to be another thing. And this is all part of the journey for them of learning about what, what really motivates them and what drives them and what lights them up. And it's okay if they find something that they love for a while and then it fizzles out. That happens with all of us. Yeah. And that's not a waste of time either, by no, the way. No, not at all. This is another question I've heard asked in sort of a snarky way. Actually, people have asked me this uh, in regards to poker. Like, do you feel like you just wasted all your time getting so good at something that like kind of doesn't matter? I mean, they right. haven't asked in those exact terms, but like that implication has come through like the, wow, you spent a lot of time on that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, I did. It was fine. You know? Like, yeah. <laughs> but you even just talked about how learning to approach it in that way totally prepared you for like your next, the next work that you did at camp, right? Well, it did a hundred percent. And 
even if it didn't, I think it was still okay. You know, like, of course, even if other people couldn't look from the outside and figure out what was so great about it that I wanted to invest so much time. Like sometimes your hobby is just your hobby. And I think many people don't take enough time to really look deep and figure out like what aspects of their hobby they're bringing into the rest of their lives. Because right. this is a, another observation I've heard in a, from actually a professional magic, the gathering player, uh, where he said that he's gotten super good at a number of different things and found that one really common thread he's noticed among experts in various fields is that they take that expertise in many cases, totally unknowingly and just apply it to all these different right, aspects of without their life. realizing that that's what they're doing. And so he was saying, he was suggesting if people wanted to improve in magic, like think about the things you're actually good at. Think about the important principles from that right. and figure out how that applies to other things you want to do. That be totally at. makes sense. That makes me think of, um, Another podcast that I've mentioned before and I've mentioned in our Facebook group and also probably on the show, it's called Exploring Unschooling and it's with Pam Larickia and she is, her her children are grown unschoolers and she often, she interviews a lot of people on her podcast and she often asks them, um, especially the people who also have grown unschoolers, she'll ask them like, now that your child is grown and doing what they're doing in the world, can you look back and see the little threads that mm. kind of led them to be doing what they're doing now? And people always can, right? They can see the little different things that happened throughout the kid's childhood or the things they were interested in or the way that they engaged with the world, how all of those things built on each other to get the kid to be doing what they're doing as a grown up. And I right. really love that mindset. And that's really an exciting thing for me as a parent of young children to just think about, to think about like how cool is that going to be when my kids are grown to look back and put those pieces together. And it also kind of keeps me in check to be like, I don't need to maneuver those pieces for my kids now. Mm. I need to stay curious and just open to what is going to be because I'll see how they all fit together in the end, but I don't need to be the, you know, the puppeteer making this process happen. It's just a really yeah. cool way to look at it. That's really funny actually. Cause like back to the dinosaurs example, Ollie was super into dinosaurs when he was like three, when he was three. And like, it was this very precocious little boy, people would come over and he would grab his dinosaurs book and be like, and this is an apatosaurus and it's the biggest known yeah. land, ma you know, whatever. And just like, not a mammal, obviously, but he would, uh, <laughs> he would just lambast them with this interesting dinosaur or trivia. And it was like, we were like kind of proud of it. Right. It was right. like, Ooh, I wonder if he's just going to love dinosaurs forever and like be a dinosaur documentarian. He said he wanted to get the word documentary tattooed on his foot at one point. Right? No, on his stomach on his stomach. Yeah. Cause he loved watching dinosaur documentaries. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so the dinosaur interest faded completely. Sure. At this point, he doesn't care about them now. And he loves animals now. Right. right? And so like, yeah, he didn't grow up to be an archeologist yet. I mean, he's eight still, so who knows? <laughs> um, but at this point, it's not looking likely that dinosaurs will be the long-term thing, but that affection towards and that interest in learning about dinosaurs, you know, there is a little thread of that continuing yeah, on. And right? there's also the thread. He still is the person who gets interested in something and goes pretty deep on it. Right. And right. that was so like the way that he approached them and engaged with them and information about them for hours every day is something that we have seen throughout other interests that he's had. Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, I think that's, it's just such a powerful point to slow yourself down. And especially with young kids, like it's true. The version that you're, if your kid is like, I mean, 20 or younger, they will be almost totally unrecognizable 10 years from now than they are now. Right. And so right. as we are trying to forecast the people that they'll become, it can be intimidating. It can be a little bit scary. And when we see these positive signs of inspiration and motivation, like it can be challenging to not try to like capture that and extrapolate it somehow. But, um, I think it's back again to the, the entrepreneurial mindset, as we talked about earlier, this, this idea of being an entrepreneur of working for yourself, um, it can be very difficult. I think for kids, if they're finding that like, so they have an idea, it's not very entrepreneurial to have your parents come in and have to tell you what to do with right. it. Right. Like if you have a business idea, no one comes up to you and forces you to put it into action or to practice and keep learning and learning and learning. And so not that it's, it's quite as direct as creating the dependency on the adult playbook that a school might be, but yeah, we can definitely run afoul of, of similar motivations. Like I see this thing that you have now, I know the best way for you to proceed with exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I have, um, I just want to mention a couple other resources or things that might be interesting to people sure. is now Let's a good it. time for that. Yeah, it's a perfect time for Great. it. Great. So 
I um, just recently, yeah, stumbled upon this article that Carrie McDonald wrote about, um, the title is Why Unschoolers Grow Up to Be Entrepreneurs. So we'll make sure that we link to that in the show notes because that's, um, I really like Carrie's writing and that's just an interesting article to read just about the idea of, you know, kids who get used to pursuing their own passions on their own terms really become good at it, right? And so, you know, her theory is that 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 will be more likely to lead to an entrepreneurial spirit. And again, I really believe that even an entrepreneurial spirit, if you are working at a job with at which you are an employee is still really beneficial to satisfaction and success and all of that. But um, so that's an interesting article. And the other thing that I want to mention is, uh, and she mentions it in this article, is Peter Gray's survey of grown unschoolers. Um, I think I've mentioned it before, and we'll link to that survey as well. But Carrie in her article mentions how his survey showed, um, I think it was more than half of the grown unschoolers in the survey were presently working as entrepreneurs when they were surveyed, mm. which is, you know, that's a pretty significant amount of them. So that's somewhat interesting. And also, she also mentions that many of the respondents indica indicated that the work that they were doing was directly linked to childhood interests that they ended up following into adulthood. And these are all unschoolers who were surveyed. So it's just kind of an interesting little bit of research that's been done on this as well. Yeah. Well, I think that's pretty compelling. I mean, 50% is a huge figure. And I don't know if in my mind, I would project 50% of all present unschoolers to be self-employed entrepreneurs someday. That just seems really high, but you know, maybe, maybe it will work out that way. Nonetheless, I think it's compelling that there's at least some level of correlation there. But I also liked, you know, just to harken back to this point a little bit more, like you mentioned the idea that these people are doing things based on interests found in childhoods. There are a lot of fields out there where being an entrepreneur is not really like a thing that most people will have access to, right? Like, so if you're going to work in summer camping, it's going to be really hard without some sort of financial backing to just start your own summer camp right. from scratch, to buy your own facility, to erect your own tents and do the whole thing, get, yeah. get approval from the government and all that kind of stuff. It's rather expensive. And so, but for many organizations like that, having worked in summer camp consulting, they are looking for people that can come in and say, okay, how do I look at this problem? Okay, well, the camp is successful in this way, but struggling in this way. How can I figure out how to get this more successful right. in terms of the year-round business? Oh, I know. I'll call this other camp that does well in the year-round business in Georgia that I formed right. a connection, right? So it's that entrepreneur thing again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that that level of approach to problems, it's like, I think one of the main takeaways, I hope that parents take away from this episode because it's so much less about, you know you know, creating, idolizing entrepreneurship or yeah. putting forth entrepreneurship as like the way to have a self-actualized, happy, financially successful life. I agree. That, that's not the point whatsoever. The point more is that if we help our kids to think entrepreneurially, which is to say, to think about solving problems on their own, to think about what's important to them, they're more likely to find themselves a in careers of their own choosing rather than you know, kind of what they happen to fall into or heaven forbid, they wind up developing a lot of skills for that. Then they feel like they have to pursue because they've right, sunk because so they much cost so into much it. time and energy yeah. into it and which, maybe money, which yeah. happens to no shortage of people. Like, you know, even if you've ever heard someone say, Oh, uh, like, Hey, where'd you go to school? And you say, Oh, I went for this and this, but I'm not using my degree. Like mm -hmm. there's a level of shame that people work through on that. I think in many cases and right. So it's about equipping people with the amount of self-knowledge to pursue the things that they're interested in. And then once they become some part of some organization, whether it's an organization of their own making or one that someone else created, being able to think for yourselves and really challenge the baseline assumptions is a skill historically that is always translated to being employable, you know, right. to being valuable yeah, absolutely. to an organization and all of the, like the little technical skills that we think are important now, like, who knows what they might be, right? Like when we grew up, it was like writing in cursive, you know, or, um, oh, right. And that's changing even faster now, right? Exactly. That changes exponential. So we have literally no idea what even fields are going to exist for our kids. Yeah. Some level of tech, what, whatever technical skill that appears to be important that everyone learn into the future, we have no idea what will be important, but we do know that these sort of softer skills, less tangible ones, like being self-motivated, um, being able to think clearly about, the problems that a business is facing, those almost certainly will still be yeah. relevant. So yeah. So that's uh sort of like entrepreneurship, but also a case for helping kids to be more self-motivated yeah. and self-directed and uh, yeah, some of our experiences and in, in putting those into practice. So hopefully Exciting stuff. you enjoy. I liked talking about it. Yeah. You did a nice job <laughs> anyway. Oh, thanks. 
Um, thank you for joining us on this journey. And as we always say, remember that each moment is a new chance to be the parent that you hope to be. Love you guys. Bye. See you next time. Thank you for listening to One Free Family. If you enjoy the podcast, please show your support by becoming a patron at onefreefamily.com slash support. Your support will help make this show better. Plus, you can get access to rewards and additional episodes by joining. Again, that's onefreefamily.com slash support. This has been a Pax Libertas Productions podcast.